by thanking the Thomistic Institute for the invitation. It's an honor and a great pleasure to be here and uh, congratulate the Thomistic Institute for this series, this interesting talks we've been having about science and religion. And why it's in my compliments to all of you present here today. Uh, while we cannot be present in, in person, it's very good to see uh, all of you here and especially some good friends uh, also from Portugal to whom I extend my compliments. And um, I will uh, try to share my screen. I think you can all see it now. And I was giving this interesting uh, subject about neuroimaging and how and what it can tell us about human beings. Um, I will try to uh, talk a little bit about neuroimaging and uh, where we stand today, the great improvements, and it's probably one of the areas in medicine uh, where the advances in recent years have been uh, greater and with a huge impact on medical care. I will then try to talk a little bit more in detail about um, uh, functional magnetic resonance. I will not be able to talk in depth, but just to give some uh, brief highlights and to um, see how this method has really changed neurosciences. And then we will try to uh, talk a little bit about what it can tell us and the impact that these imaging techniques have on human being and our understanding. And I will uh, start exactly by uh, a recent article by Antonio Damasio that um, addressed this uh, exact same issue, how neurosciences and neuroimaging can help us to understand human nature. And it, it's interesting to see how he addresses this issue. Uh, from his point of view, neurosciences have had an immense impact in our daily life. Uh, it, it changes uh, the way that we view almost any human activity from eating uh, to one's life, the medications, everything. And uh, from his point of view, it's possible to actually change human behavior by acting on um, our understanding of the uh, neurosciences and the brain. And this data uh, from his point of view, again, will probably help us to uh, make human beings better, happier and more satisfied. In his article, he will highlight how different areas of neurosciences have come to uh, make us increase in this knowledge. And neuroimaging is a part of how we've been able to get more knowledge about the brain. But he finishes the article with a very interesting statement that uh, in our current knowledge of the brain and uh, the more and more that we know, leads us to this conclusion that it is so complicated in fact that it is a miracle that it works. And I think it's an interesting way to actually end this article and we'll come back to that. Neurosciences and in particular neuroimaging are present today in an universal and transversal way in, a, in almost any area and field from medicine to psychology, education, economics, uh, but even sports and fashion or law. And uh, it's, it's very interesting to, to read all the medical literature uh, concerning brain imaging. It's probably one of the areas where we find more publications and more articles um, in the medical field. There has been a great development in our understanding the brain and its mechanisms of functioning. And neuroimaging plays a huge role in, in this understanding. We can now have images of really high quality that will make us understand not only the anatomy, but the function. And this will have tremendous impact in uh, several areas. This brain imaging has had an exponential growth and has led to uh, great improvements in, our, in the knowledge that we have from the brain, not only in anatomy and, and physiology, but also in understanding disease processes and using this knowledge, for example, to map uh, and plan surgical procedures. Especially functional uh, studies uh, that are non-disease related have led, have led to an attempt to explain human beings, human behavior, and even culture to the brain and brain imaging and its function. And it's uh, very interesting to just review that it wasn't so long ago that x-rays were uh, discovered. You see here Bronten and the first x-ray that he took from his wife's hand and this images from the late uh, 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. And it's not so long ago 
that we had this huge developments and now have this incredible machinery and this uh, sophisticated equipment that can give us fantastic brain uh, imaging that are now, now widely available in hospitals, universities, and all research sites. Using magnetic resonance that has really changed the way that we look at the brain, we can now not only have structural image, but actually understand uh, how the tissues are uh, made of the composition, the vascularization, but actually look at uh, certain substances and this huge area of understanding the function. All this has led to an incredible amount of data. And now we have the aid of artificial intelligence and algorithms uh, that will help us to understand and integrate all this uh, information. I bring you here some structural imaging, just uh, um, simple um, structural T1 images of the brain. And you can see how these images really have a high um, anatomical um, quality that will help us in vivo to actually have access to, to the brain. Using uh, high field magnets, we can image the brain now almost to, to an histological quality. Uh, and this in vivo will give us access to tissue composition and uh, understand um, the um, so, um, specific areas that we can study uh, in vivo. We can also look at different substances and you can see here um, in magnetic resonance of neuromelanin and this can help us to diagnose, for example, Parkinson's disease with the loss of these uh, areas that have this pigment. And this has improved greatly our ability to diagnose, for example, Parkinson's disease in vivo in very early disease stages, or for example, to actually study dopamine and um, the, the presence of uh, changes, for example, in patients with uh, first psychotic breaks. And this is an interesting area uh, that we can study in vivo, uh, the components and areas uh, of the brain but also with um, the diffusion of water actually have images of the white matter and uh, again, study in vivo uh, how these tracts are organized and how we can, um, um, they connect different areas of the brain. You see here images of the pyramidal tract of the motor system, but also connecting to the cerebellum. And these images will give us access to not only understanding anatomy, but uh, uh, understanding pathological processes. We can study perfusion. We can understand how different lesions in the normal brain are actually um, vascularized. We can understand tissue, tissue composition using uh, certain sequences that will uh, allow us to understand what are the different components of the tissues. Another very interesting area is fetal MR. Now we can image the development of the brain in, in the mother's um, womb and actually understand the development and uh, study uh, different pathologies, not only morphological in terms of development, but also using the diffusion um, studies to actually understand the white matter tracts and the development. And this is also true in understanding how the uh, brain uh, will develop, how it will age, and uh, there's a, a lot of studies on it, how, we, how neuroimaging can contribute to the development and uh, understanding of the uh, cognitive functions. We have gained a lot of knowledge about uh, the anatomy and function of different cognitive functions of certain areas and language and motor systems are uh, among uh, the ones that we have gained a lot of uh, knowledge. And um, the image and MR especially have been crucial for our understanding of uh, all of this. But I will address in, in a little more detail how this uh, functional MR uh, images uh, are acquired and the impact that they will have, because as you will see a little bit later, uh, we all are exposed to it, and it's one of these techniques that has um, completely um, came to the public field and more, more and more is in our lives. Uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging is currently the most important 
imaging tool for research in neurosciences. There are a, a great number of articles. You can see the exponential growth in publications in the last years um, that has uh, and, and continues to grow. A lot of areas of research um, have been um, the, the focus of publication, mainly functional and location and anatomy, but also uh, addressing neuropsychology. And this has been one of the areas that has grown um, exponentially. I will not have time to go in depth in terms of the physics of MR or how uh, magnetic uh, resonance in terms of functional acquisition will um, works, but I will try to give you just a brief overview. Uh, we have a control system that will generate or present some stimulus uh, to a subject and we'll try to monitor the response to that subject. This will happen in sync with uh, image acquisition and we will try to detect using um, most of the times this bold signal. Uh, and I will try to explain a little bit how this works. And we will uh, try to sync this image acquisition with the generation of stimuli, and this will give us an image. So whenever there's an activity, a specific task that's being performed, we have some biophysical variation with metabolic and hemodynamic changes. And this is, it's this indirect measure that we will we'll try to capture with the image. Whenever there's a change in the, the activity in a certain brain area, we will increase the consumption of glycose and oxygen, and uh, this will lead, lead to an increase in blood flow. This um, increase in blood flow will actually increase the oxyhemoglobin, and this will lead to a change in the signal in that area that will be captured by image. It, it's, it's a very simple explanation, but uh, it's actually very complicated. And to get an image, we have a lot of pre-processing and analyzing methods, and I will not have time to go into detail, but you can see that um, a lot of steps that are now automated will have to be performed to actually get to the final image that we have here. So we have the image of a simple motor task of uh, opening and closing the hand. And you can see the uh, activating area in the motor cortex in the area corresponding to the uh, activity of the hand. And you will see that it's greater in the left hemisphere since this um, subject was right-handed and also the co-activation of the cerebellum. Uh, here we have a motor task of the tongue. And again, we will have the activation in the area of the motor cortex corresponding to the tongue movements. So what are we looking at here? We're seeing the uh, sync image of the, connect the activation of the hand with the acquisition and changes of these images that are um, susceptible to uh, and will detect these changes in uh, oxyhemoglobin. So we're actually seeing a difference between uh, the breast and activation areas. And we're seeing a, sort of a, st a parametric statistic map. In terms of a clinic, we will use these images, in, for example, in pre-surgical planning. And this is very helpful whenever you have a lesion uh, that is close to areas that are functionally important when, it, when you're trying to remove a tumor or uh, an area that's involved in uh, epilepsy. And we will study these areas around the lesion to actually um, try the that the surgeons will not uh, make some damage in these areas. This is especially true when you're uh, close to language or motor areas. And uh, you see here, for example, this tumor that was close to areas that are important for language. And uh, you will try to avoid damaging the, these areas when you're in the surgical procedure. So it's uh, very useful when you're in surgical planning to actually identify these areas and guide the surgery. Another area that's been very um, important in uh, recent years and has had a tremendous growth is resting state uh, MRI. Uh, we'll, here you will uh, have the image of a connective um, resting state uh, activation that will give you uh, the networks and uh, the uh, activation in terms of different systems uh, such as um, sens sensitivity or uh, motor. 
uh, there's a, also a great interest in connectivity analysis using the different uh, algorithms that will give you an idea of how the different areas of the brain are actually connected to each other. And again, it's an area that's very interesting and with great development in the last years. All this information has led to a, gro a growing understanding of brain function, not only in terms of the, of the motor functions, but also in terms of memory, language. But then you have this uh, huge area of cognition where these techniques have been used. And you will have a lot of publications in terms of neuronal basis of uh, different activities uh, to study um, compassion, admiration, honesty, lies, Etc. And I would like to address with you some of the technical and methodolo methodological issues that are um, that um, are uh, involved in this imaging uh, techniques. And I would start by these two questions: Can these imaging methods give us really an idea of how the brain works? And what exactly are we seeing while we use this fMRI techniques? The first question is, are neuroimagings like photographs of the brain? Is this uh, fantastic colorful imagings that we're seeing like photographs, like we're taking and capturing something that's really happening in the brain? And I always start with my students and residents with this uh, understanding of what they're actually seeing. What is an image? When you're looking at an image of the brain, what exactly are you uh, seeing? And I think this is very important uh, when, whenever you're in, in this medical imaging field. And I al always like to show them this uh, painting by René Magritte that um, uh, for them, it's sort of a, a remembrance whenever they're looking at a, a picture that this is not a pipe. This is the image of a pipe. And uh, Magritte has put it really well with the title of his painting, uh, the, the Treason of Images. And I think we have to keep it in mind whenever you, you're looking at um, an image, even if it's a very sophisticated fMRI image of the brain, that we are looking at an image. So this is not the brain, this is the image of the brain. More specifically, this is the fMRI, and a specifically fMRI image of the brain. And I think we do need to keep that in mind. Uh, uh, after this, I think we have to consider some technical and methodological issues, and especially understanding what we're looking at. Some of the interpretation that are um, underlie the images, but also methodological aspects of the acquisition and the post processing. And this is crucial when you're dealing with uh, this kind of images that um, have a lot of post processing and have a lot of statistics afterwards. I will not have time to go in depth in terms of all these areas that can be involved with these images due to time issues, but I think we do need to keep in mind that when you're getting to this, we're dealing with very uh, statistic um, information that we need to, to, to keep in mind. Uh, first of all, we are assuming when we're looking at functional uh, MR imaging that th it reflects neuronal activity. And uh, it needs to, to be um, addressed that the activated area is not equal to neuronal mechanisms. This is an implication uh, that has uh, to be kept in mind when we're analyzing the data. And this is fre frequently overlooked. Uh, then we might think that there is an, a direct analogy between the spiking of uh, neurons that we can do with animals and the fMRI signal. And this is unrealistic and might lead to incorrect conclusions. And I think we need to keep in mind always that fMRI is an indirect method. And we are not looking directly at neuronal mechanisms. We're seeing different uh, links between this activity and the image. And um, this being an indirect method, we need to uh, keep in mind while we're reading the scanners. What is the meaning of this active and inactive brain areas that we see when we look at these images? Well, we need to keep in mind that uh, since the entire brain can be involved, 
in the representation of even very simple tasks, uh, when we see just one simple area, what does that mean? And uh, another issue is that activated areas in a task may not be needed for that task. Uh, for example, if you do some fMRI experiment and you have an activation in an area, um, there are some studies, and especially in some um, uh, tasks, that if you take that area away, it will not give rise to a deficit. So activation and uh, the uh, deficits and the implication of that areas in a task are not um, something that has a direct connection. Then it's important to keep in mind as well that processes will lead to activation patterns rather than specific areas. And sometimes it's more important to understand the pattern that identifying a specific area. Another issue that's very important when we're dealing with all of this um, understanding of how the brain works is the models of brain mechanisms and brain uh, studies that underlie this uh, fMRI experiments. In terms of methodological issues concerning fMRI, the experimental design is crucial when you're understanding this imaging. So most of the studies will uh, either use a block design or an event design to uh, uh, study uh, a process. And this, um, has in my, has uh, as a background that the cognitive process can be inserted into a task without affecting the remainder. And is this assertion true? Well, most neuroimaging studies will provide no formal task analysis that could actually ensure to us that this pro particular cognitive process is actually being isolated. So when you're doing a task and then the rest, task and rest, and you, you're imaging all of this, you need to make sure that the task is actually not influencing the rest and the opposite. And most of the studies will not provide a formal analysis that will ensure that this is the case. And different patterns of activation can, uh, when revealed only in cases when the stimuli have di are distinct and not overlapping in terms of spatial representation. And if they are, you will not be able to detect them if they, they are very um, close by or even using uh, some uh, areas that can be common. So again, you need to keep this in mind. And whenever you're reading an, uh, a study, actually look at the uh, analysis and the formal tax, tasks that were performed. I will not have time to go into that in terms of statistics, but it's very important because you're comparing uh, using statistical tests to actually make a difference between this activation and rest. And you're doing multiple comparisons and this will lead to a lot of implications in terms of the statistical analysis. And uh, it's very important when you're dealing with small areas and all the errors that can uh, arise from this. I will only give you this uh, interesting, um, uh, this idea from this uh, very interesting article that will uh, highlight the importance of the statistics that is involved in all of this. This uh, team purchased a death Atlantic salmon and placed it into an MR. And they would show it photographs of people in various situations and would ask the salmon to actually guess what people were feeling and guess what? A tiny active area in the salmon's brain was found in response to the task. And this is a very um, elegant and interesting and funny uh, experiment to actually highlight this point that um, chance alone could have uh, led to the results to be statistically significant because we are, you're doing so many subtractions, you're doing so many comparisons that chance alone could, could have led to that. So this is an interesting um, article to actually highlight the importance of uh, understanding the statistics and the images that we're getting. Uh, this uh, article that has now uh, um, a couple of uh, some years uh, actually highlighted some of other important issues that you need to consider while you are reading uh, and looking at fMRI images. The, the problem of reproducibility, uh, the meaning and interpretation of this bold signal, what does it mean, what, what, what underlies this activation areas. And they would, hire, uh, they would actually um, 
uh, talk about the oversimplification of the activation patterns that were associated with the real world task, for example, lying. If you could just um, use an MR scanner to try to reproduce a real uh, um, situation in the world and if the two would be comparable. And uh, this is something that needs to be considered as well. The second point that I would like to talk about is the content issues in terms of concepts and definitions. And uh, I think the most important question is if it's possible to measure or to make an image of concepts. Because if the names are not correct, language is not in accordance with the truth of things. And this is very important when you're dealing with um, concepts such as intelligence, spirituality, how can we measure? How can we make images of these concepts? Well, first of all, you will need a conceptual definition. And how can we get it? How can we get a conceptual definition of something like intelligence or spirituality? Well, you'll try to get uh, to philosophical and religious tradition. You will use full concepts. You will talk to a lot of people and ask them what, what they think. You will make questionnaires. And then you will try to get a consensual definition of whatever subject you're trying to study. But then you will need to oper operationize and make a conceptual definition more. Um, you will try to, to use a number for that um, concept that you're trying to study. For example, for intelligence, use the IQ. Then you will not need to test that definition. Give the IQ test to several people and try to compare and study it. And then you will redefine it and see if the conceptual definition that you had was correct. And if you then uh, try to look again to the steps, you started with the conceptual definition, you uh, try to operationalize that definition, you will then test that definition and redefine it. But then that will change the conceptual definition that you started with. And this will go round and round and you have created an epistemological circuit. And this needs to be considered whenever you're studying any of these concepts with this kind of uh, technology. And for me, that is a key issue when you're addressing modern neurosciences, trying to, to uh, combine the biology with the social sciences, because concepts can diverge from reality. We need to, a, a careful definition of terms and um, th that for me in, in neuroscience is, is especially, uh, it's, it's very, very um, important because if you don't do that, we can um, uh, use uh, uh, this kind of uh, technology somehow like an inverted phrenology and use scans to tell us something about behavior is actually uh, going to, to lead in that way. Uh, I will in terms of intelligence, just bring you this sentence uh, that what is the trick that makes us intelligence? Well, the trick is that there is no trick. The power of intelligence stems from our diversity, not from any principle, not any perfect principle. Another very interesting example that uh, was in the literature some years ago is trying to image wisdom or to use the neurobiology of wisdom. And it starts by our definition of wisdom. And it's interesting how these authors, and I, um, I strongly recommend that you um, read these articles and, and read it with this kind of um, understanding of what's behind and trying to, to see how these authors try to um, define wisdom. And you will see uh, all this effort uh, in terms of um, definition and the correlation with the neuroanatomical location. And uh, this actually led to the public opinions in, to the public opinion with this article, what is wisdom and experts define it. And this is um, one of the areas in medicine where uh, all this technology is now in the public opinion. Uh, the proclamation of being able to see the brain in, ap in action has actually captured the popular imagination and this is present in um, almost all fields. I just brought some um, illustrative examples like the God spot revealed. Do you believe in God or is that a software glitch? Faith in the brain, fMRI as a brain, uh, as a lie detector or sex, money and food. fMRI reveals how the brain processes reward, uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
or for example, uh, sex, lies, and brain scan, how fMRI reveals what really goes on in our minds, or the science of mind reading, and actually being able to see the nature of thoughts. And um, I will then try to, to, to discuss and to address a little bit about uh, how this has impacted the way that we see human beings and what it can tell us about human beings. Neuroimaging used to support is very is used now to support theories and approaches in uh, numerous works and a multiplicity of areas. Imaging studies are taken as a validation or invalidation of work views, and it appears to the public as a very sophisticated explanation and a scientific authority. Seeing is believing, and. Um, this, uh, there is this belief that these images can capture our uh, visual evidence and is, is, it comes to the public as uncritically real. The MR image presentation can actually increase the reader's assessment of the quality of an argument as is um, presented very interestingly in this article. And this gives an increased responsibility to researchers in the field of neuroimaging to present their work and in the press uh, to present these results. There are a lot of impacts in terms of how when we understand human beings, not only in an individual level, but also uh, collectively about uh, in the way that we understand the human person. Individually, it gives us an idea of biological determinism and reductionism. Uh, we, we get reduced to improving our neurotransmitter uh, to actually uh, understand what will do um, uh, some good to some um, brain areas, how certain tasks can actually enhance certain areas. It does change and uh, has impact in our understanding of characteristics as being determined by the brain uh, that will be presented as immutable and not dependent on a self-will. And uh, I think for some people, will appear as easy answers to very complex problems. Collectively, in the way that we understand the human person, there are a lot of issues, and I will not have time to get into it, but this um, immense and a very interesting um, issue of free will and responsibility, and especially how we understand the mind-brain-body uh, connection. There is an attempt by neuroci neuroscientists and especially neuroimaging to uh, explain all human behavior, all human beings and culture to the image of the brain and its function with the subjectivity and the personal identity reduced to the brain. And here brain will be used implicitly for concepts such as person, individual or self leading to a neurodeterminism, uh, helping um, and um, as proclaimed as explaining and predicting all human behavior. And you can see it uh, put into action in this task of um, trying to map the, the, the brain. And uh, you see here how it is proclaimed that our brains make us who we are. And by understanding the brains, we will be able to, to understand ourselves, beauty, to teach our, our children, to remember our loved ones, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, hope, hopefully uh, for this task to actually lead us to a different future. Concerning this mind-brain-body relationship, you see here clearly a materialistic and dualistic view. And especially this dualistic view is very present in our understanding of uh, the, the mind brain body relationship in these areas. There's a sharp division of between the material and corporal with the spiritual and mental, and it is the mental and the spiritual that will uh, ultimately matter. So the person is equal to the mind, intellect, mental subject, and uses the body only as an instrument, sort of a ghost in the machine uh, understanding of the human being. Uh, I will try to finish with some final thoughts, and I do hope that this uh, very brief presentation will give you an idea of the exponential growth in the neuroimaging area with our great knowledge in terms of the anatomy and functioning of the brain, but also in terms of the human behavior and development and uh, this 
um, tremendous impact that it has in our uh, understanding of pathological changes. fMRI is a very important research tool in the neuroscience uh, field, uh, but it's very important. And I, I would like to highlight this, that it's very important whenever you're reading and looking at these images that you understand what you're seeing and understand the strengths and limitations of the studies. fMRI is now part of the public opinion and appears as a powerful validation of worldviews. And we do need to keep this in mind. And I, I do think that there is a strong influence of neuroimaging in our understanding of the human person on an individual and a collective level. And I would like to finish with this sentence that uh, brain, image, brain imaging will become more precise. New technologies are yet to be unveiled or even envisioned. Yet no matter how dazzling the fruits of inquiry or how clever the means by which they are obtained, it is our values that will guide us in implementing them for good or for bad. The danger lies in muddling those values under the pretense of following where neuroscience is supposedly lead us. And I do think we need to keep this in mind. And I would like to thank you again uh, for being here, for your attention, and um, congratulating the Domestic Institute for this initiatives. And uh, we would take now some questions and maybe have some debate on the subject. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sofia. That was uh, very uh, interesting and packed with lots of information. Uh, I have information. I have myself have a number of questions, but I guess I should rather let uh, other listeners to go first. So first I will read a, a question that comes from Luca uh, Settimo. Um, so he says this, uh, thanks to the, uh, thanks for the presentation, interesting. Given the title of this presentation, Neuroimaging, what can it tell us about human beings? Can you say a few more words uh, about what is unique in human beings when compared to non-human beings, according to neuroimaging? Uh, my impression, uh, says Luca, is that uh, fMRI results are quite similar in the sense that uh, the chemical, biological composition of the brain of human and non-human is actually very similar. Uh, so, uh, so uh, and you also mentioned the experiment with the fish, uh, so, um, so yeah, that's the question. So, so what does neuroimaging uh, help us to see the considerable differences maybe uh, when we compare human beings to other species? Well, thank you. Thank you so much for, for the question. And um, neuroimaging and uh, especially um, fMRI is, is a tool that will help us to actually uh, understand and view some, some areas. Um, and it will uh, help us to understand not the differences and the similarities in terms of uh, different functions. So it's not, um, it's a tool that we will use to, to study uh, different uh, characteristics. Uh, for example, language, um, memory, um, different kinds of cognitive functions that are different in uh, humans as opposed to different species. So uh, maybe I should explain a little bit more about that um, salmon experiment. So that was not to compare the salmon's brain with the human brain. It was actually just a fun experience to, to, uh, to uh, give, uh, to, to make us aware of uh, how statistics and uh, multiple comparisons tests can actually have an impact in the results that we're seeing. So um, if you compare a lot of used statistical st tests to make um, a lot of com comparisons, chance alone can give you a, a result. And that was their um, fun way of actually um, uh, uh, showing that. So it was not a comparison study between the salmon's brain and the human brain. It was just um, a way of showing how statistics can uh, really have an impact on the results that we're seeing. So we're not seeing images, we're seeing parametric statistical maps and we need to keep it in mind while we're seeing that. Um, so just to make that clear, um, we are using this uh, techniques as we use all different kinds of techniques in terms of um, 
psychology and medicine to understand how humans are uh, different and, and study our cognitive uh, functions that are different from other uh, animals. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if I answered the question, but... Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, next question comes from Rita Ruoyayok Singh. Uh, so, here's the question. Uh, you mentioned that neuroscience is established based on the assumption that the signals we receive from the brain scans are indicative of specific brain activity. Now, in this case, how do you differentiate the actual signal from the noise when interpreting those brain signals? In other words, how do you know if one cluster of signals is useful for analysis while the others are not? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, I didn't have a lot of time to go in depth in terms of um, um, explaining how that all works. But the idea is that you perform a task and then you have, if you use a, 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 block, a block model, that you have a task and then you have the rest and you will compare both of them. So in terms of analysis, you will try to, to use a, a, a task that will give you enough activation that is different from the rest. And you will compare both of those images and then the signal that you have in terms of difference will be um, assumed to come from that activity. For example, uh, using that motor uh, experiment, you are uh, for 30 seconds opening and closing your hand, then you stop, you open, you close your hands and you stop. And you will measure the, you will have image of all those um, um, time, and then you will subtract the two. And the difference in terms of activation of that, um, um, while you are doing the task and the, the rest uh, will give you the difference. And that will um, be mapped in terms of um, um, anatomical area. And the difference between the two will appear as you have seen in the motor cortex in that a specific area. So you are performing a statistical test that will tell you if the difference is significant or not. So uh, you will compare both of them using a statistical test to actually understand if the difference between the, the activation and the rest is statistically significant. So again, that will, um, lead to the importance of the statistics while you're comparing uh, this multiple blocks of activation and rest. So I'm mm -hmm. not sure if I answer your mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. So uh, that's, I... that's why, that's how we see it's, it's significant. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you, Sofia. So the next question comes from uh, Oao Durate Black, and I will, uh, allow myself because I have a similar question and I will slightly develop on the original question asked uh, on chat. And basically, uh, it refers to uh, the philosophical um, uh, understanding or, or aspect of, of all uh, this work that is being done uh, in neuroimaging. Because you mentioned, so basically uh, the, the, the uh, well, I don't know if this is a pre pre presupposition or not, but it, it may seem uh, that uh, this entire technique is rather uh, reductionist, as you have mentioned, uh, that it reduces, uh, you know, a certain uh, phenomena that we observe in human beings, thoughts, uh, ideas, uh, action, reaction, and, and so forth, to those activity in the brain. Now, you've mentioned that uh, there are those who uh, tend to think dualistically. My question would be uh, building on this question uh, that I have just mentioned, that it seems like it's purely reductionistic. Uh, is it property dualism or substance, substance dualism? And uh, to what extent those who work in your imaging and are maybe interested in uh, philosophical questions, to what extent they are willing to uh, buy into e uh, emergentist theories, uh, uh, or they rather tend to uh, uh, like remain reductionist uh, and materialist in their understanding of how uh, like those two levels translate into one another. Thank you, Father Marius, and especially a um, uh, great thank to Dr. João Black for being here. It's, a, it's an honor and a privilege, and thank you for the question. 
And uh, it's not a technique that is materialistic or uh, reductionist. It, the technique is just a technique. It's something that can be used and it has uh, indications. And uh, we need to especially understand what it does, what it tells us. And um, um, my point was that it can be used uh, to actually um, uh, give rise to or uh, give uh, some sort of uh, scientific corroboration of certain ideas that underlie um, some visions of men. So it's not, it's not a technique in itself, it's how we sometimes use it and how we see certain ideas that underlie neurosciences in general. So um, the technique is just a tool that can be used and it, it, it has um, a great implication of how our, our understanding of how the brain works. And it has um, given us um, a great amount of knowledge about the uh, operation and how the brain functions in vivo. And it has increased our knowledge immensely. So uh, it is the um, underlying um, uh, worldviews and the view of human beings that is philosophical in, in itself. And as you said, we do uh, experience more and more a dualistic understanding of the human being uh, that is sometimes present um, in our understanding of the human beings and influences how we uh, view certain concepts. So uh, my point was that we do need to separate this um, tool, uh, its interpretation for the back, from the background understanding of the human beings and how concepts are used uh, in a, some, sometimes in a not very scientific way uh, when we try to use some techniques to try to prove them. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if I answered your okay. question, but yeah. my, that was my point, that it's okay. not a technique in itself, it's uh, how the we use yeah. Yeah. some and I, I, of the, the knowledge, and mm -hmm. uh, it will be used to give some mm -hmm. sort of a scientific cooperation, uh, corroboration to some ideas, and we do need to separate those ideas from what the technique is mm -hmm. actually telling us. Okay, thank you. So I just building on this question because I think this is one of the most important questions uh, question uh, here for us who come from a, a philosophical and theological perspective. So, yes, we have to distinguish the method from its interpretation. I get it. Now, working in the field, uh, how do you see the environment? Uh, there is there a tendency to interpret it in again rather reductionist way or rather a non-reductionist way and. Uh, the other question, is the concept uh, of mind still present uh, or it's just the brain? And if there is the concept of mind, uh, if it is present in those interpretations within the field of uh, in, uh, uh, neuroimaging and neuro, uh, science and neurobiology, uh, then what would be the relation between mind and brain? Okay, that, that would be a conference in itself, Father Marius, and uh, I would not be the person to give it. So the mind-body relationship and all the philosophical questions that uh, lie behind it, is, it's a, a, a very, very important issue for philosophical and theological and biological and medical reflection. So, but it would be a conference on itself. So um, maybe you could organize it, but uh, and, and the Thomistic has a lot on that. But my, my answer to, to that question would be that um, when you're dealing with a neuroimaging, and if you are in the field, uh, you are performing science and you are uh, looking at the results in, uh, pardon for the um, repetition, in a scientific way. And that, that uh, will lead to a lot of, again, understanding of how the brain works. And uh, my point would, was that whenever you're using this for um, reading and, and trying to extrapolate for uh, complex concepts and uh, using this tool for something that it won't tell you, uh, it will lead to um, a certain uh, use of um, scientific proof uh, for some theories that underlie our understanding of the human uh, nature and not exactly uh, fMRI or neuroimaging. 
So I, I do think that this um, uh, neurosciences will, um, uh, neurosciences that are taken not um, uh, exactly as um, um, a direct uh, use of these techniques, but uh, a combination of social, social sciences and trying to define and using um, some sort of um, um, scientific explanations for this concept, uh, that is for me where the problem arises. Uh, this combination of very complex philosophical problems, the definition of concepts, uh, our understanding of, of very um, complex issues using this kind of um, reductionist um, approach, that would be uh, where I think we need to reflect seriously. And as um, uh, scientists involved in the field, uh, we do need to understand the limitations and um, um, the um, uh, applicability of these techniques and what will actually tell you and what, we, what it won't and what is science and what is the underlying uh, views that we have of human beings. Thank you. Uh, and still, scientists, uh, as, I got, as, as, as we could see uh, from the titles that you presented, they produce those uh, catchy titles <laughs> that seem to like explain virtually everything. But OK, I hope we will have time for two more questions. One comes uh, from one of the listeners. And basically, re in, refer in reference to your uh, work, uh, you work uh, with a Parkinson's disease. How does uh, neuroimaging uh, possibly translate to uh, uh, to maybe like helping or, or curing this disease? Well, again, thank you for that question. Uh, I, I didn't address that specifically, but we have gained a, a lot of knowledge in terms of imaging of, of Parkinson's disease, not only for uh, understanding the pathophysiology of disease, but also for early diagnosis. Uh, but all, but monitoring therapy and actually seeing how the, the disease evolves. So using MR, uh, we can actually in vivo detect uh, the, the generation of the negros striatal areas and especially the substantia nigra and uh, those changes that will happen very early in the course of the disease. And we can actually make a very early diagnosis using just uh, MR, especially with the, that technique that I showed you uh, using neuromelanin. Uh, the substantia nigra has that pigment that is connected to the um, uh, skin uh, melanin, and it will be lost uh, very early in the course of the disease as those uh, neurons will uh, die or degenerate. And you will mm -hmm. lose that pigment and we can detect that uh, using uh, just simple MR. And that is very important, not only uh, to treat patients early, but to actually make differential diagnosis with other conditions. And uh, I do think it will give us uh, more and more information about how the disease works, how we can impact in terms of therapy um, and um, possibly in the future when, when we have therapies that will change the course of the disease, uh, we can use these imaging techniques to actually detect patients sooner. So it has increased immensely in the last years, mm -hmm. our understanding of the disease, how we diagnose, uh, how we make the diagnosis and how we monitor uh, these patients. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So maybe one uh, last question, and this comes from me again, uh, moving beyond therapy uh, today, uh, I'm, I read something about uh, those the, the movement of uh, human enhancement, transhumanism, and posthumanism, uh, and it, obviously the question is to what extent it is a significant movement and to what extent it's still uh, you know science fiction or to what extent it's actually science. So I was wondering, with, again within uh, your uh, uh, like environment that you work uh, in among the people that you know, do they speak about using those uh, those technologies that uh, that you uh, or techniques that you spoken here about not only to uh, for therapy but also uh, uh, in terms of like enhancement human enhancement changing uh, our uh, capabilities uh, you know transhumanists they speak about changing our memory our psychology moral predispositions attachment to uh, or bonding to other people even uh, levels of self esteem and so forth and so forth so i was wondering if this is just a philosophical uh, you know uh, dreaming dream or there are actually people who 
think seriously about uh, those things in science and medicine. Thank you again for that challenging question. And again, it would be a, a conference on itself talking about transhumanism, but I do think it's a very prevalent idea. Uh, not only transhumanism, but post-humanism. Uh, it's, it's a very prevalent idea, not only um, in our scientific media, but as, especially in the public opinion. Uh, we do um, view uh, our future as being potentiated by technology to be able to um, get rid of all the limitations of the human being to make us smarter and beautiful, more beautiful and more fit. And I do think it's, it has become a very um, common idea that's always there. And especially, yes, in terms of uh, medical research and um, how uh, great technology is being used by big corporations and a lot of money is being invested in terms of understanding how you can potentiate certain areas and um, uh, not only to understand how it works, but actually to be able to potentiate it. And I do think that it is a prevalent idea in our uh, understanding um, and our, our uh, scientific uh, efforts. I do think it's true. But again, I do think it's a philosophical idea and our change of the, the way that we see human beings that we, it's being brought to the scientific uh, areas and not the other way around. I do think it, it is our idea of how we understand human nature and human beings that it's being um, implemented and being pursued in, in, certain, in certain fields. And, and that ideas are completely prevalent in, in some of the neurosciences areas, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. That was very inspiring. Uh, thank you for uh, this lecture. lecture. Thank, I would like to thank all uh, those who participated in it. Uh, as I said before, that closes our series for this academic year, but we hope uh, to have another series of uh, those lectures, uh, online lectures on science and religion next year. So please tune up and check uh, uh, our best way to do is probably to sign up for our uh, bulletin uh, and you will receive any information uh, when they will uh, start again. So thank you once again. Uh, God bless you. Have a good night um, and see you again. Hopefully.